Welcome to the Dr. Leadership Show, where we take a look at how you approach your work and personal life and how we can make the most out of both of them. A weekly get-together where we get real about self-improvement and development as we all make this not-so-easy journey through life. Our discussions will cover ideas and concepts from how to grow your career to how to lead your family towards prosperity and happiness. We don't pretend to know it all, and the doctor is the first to be vulnerable, discussing his own weaknesses, both past and present. This is about growing together and having some fun while we discuss what is happening in the crazy world we live in and how to make the most of it. Let's strive for awesome together. Let's get after it. Good day, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Doctor Leadership Podcast. Hope you're having an awesome Wednesday. Hey, Labor Day just happened, the unofficial end of summer. Uh, I'm a little bummed, but I love fall. The other great thing that happened this weekend was college football started. So uh, Hawks are 1-0, and they scored some points. There is a God. Uh, but hope you enjoyed your extra day off. You know, I was just thinking here um, about about Labor Day, and it's like, well, maybe I ought to share a little bit about how that even came about real quick before we get started. So hope you had an awesome one. Hope the barbecue went great. Hope the uh, the brisket turned out perfect. Hopefully the burgers were just right. Hopefully the steaks were great. Whatever trips your trigger, your little veggie skewers, if that's your deal. But uh, hope you had an awesome time with family and friends. Now, the, the first unofficial Labor Day goes all the way back to September 5th of 1882 in New York City. It was unofficial, but by eight, and it was about 10,000 people celebrated a parade, union laborers, et cetera. The labor uh, unions had made some significant strides in the, uh, uh, in the 1880s, 1890s, where they, you know, it used to be you work seven days a week, as many hours as the boss asked you to. And lots of injuries, uh, our longevity was very short, and the, the workers needed to have a little bit more voice here. And uh, again, they had some successes. So in New York, they celebrated in 1894, and that was the first unofficial one, and it was on September 5th of 1882, as I said. And then by 1894, it was an official holiday, according to Congress. And how they made it official is they passed an act to celebrate the holiday on the first Monday of each September, instead of saying always September 5th, they said, let's just always make it a Monday, make it a three-day banger for a weekend, and uh, the rest is history. So again, I hope you had a wonderful Labor Day celebrating everyone's hard work and the unofficial end of summer, or instead of something ending, the official or unofficial start of fall, of autumn. Change is coming. And if you live uh, north of about uh, southern Illinois, um, cold's coming <laughs> and it's okay. It's okay. It was actually a pretty nice winter last year. Uh, just a few snowstorms and then one vicious, vicious week of cold. But anyway, so this week, I hope that you were able to go out and join the membership site, www.drleadershipresults.com. Click on subscribe, five bucks a month, get your early access at interviews, early access to this podcast. You could have had this podcast, uh, last weekend because that's when I record it and upload it into the stratosphere here for all of the members. And I appreciate all the members uh, members joining. Had some pretty good results there over the last several months. Uh, continues to slowly climb up, but uh, Daddy still needs help. So please go out and join. It's five bucks. If you don't get uh, something out of it, uh, you can cancel any time. See, the thing is, is it shows a commitment to working on yourself a little bit. Again, I don't have all the answers. I'm sharing how I did it wrong nine out of ten times self-deprecating humor and uh, letting you know what not to do. But man, invest in yourself, right? Warren Buffett said, the best investment you could ever make is in yourself. And we're here to talk about the Oracle of Omaha for part two of last week's episode. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, we called it the Oracle of Omaha 12 Decisions, and this is part de, part two, part dos. I speak all sorts of languages. And last week we discussed the first six key decisions in life, according to this Oracle of Omaha, as we know as Warren Buffett, 94 years young this week, actually, I believe yesterday. And today, we're going to finish up with the second six decisions. Now, as a reminder, we're going to rewind. It's kind of like the uh, um, the um, catch up from the prior week. What'd you miss? We got to give you a few pointers here so you know what you missed. Uh, and then you can go back and listen to the last episode as soon as this one's over, if you've got a nice drive going on today. But in part one, Warren talked about six key decisions. And what he is saying is his success, and let's face it, the guy's a pretty successful guy, not just monetarily, but how to live your life, how to give, how to 
act, how to be humble, how to help others. He has made thousands and thousands and thousands of people very successful from a monetary and financial security standpoint. And the guy's just a friggin' smart guy. Midwestern uh, proud, Midwestern tough, Midwestern common sense, and uh, just been a great attribute uh, for this great country of ours. But uh, the first six, in case you missed it, now the, uh, I'll just go through them. The first one is the decision to nurture curiosity. And uh, Warren started early, right? Had his dad take him up to the New York Stock Exchange when he was like 12 years old. This guy was before his time. Now, people matured and grew up much faster in the 40s uh, and the 30s. They didn't uh, sit around and get coddled by parents and live in the basement uh, take a year off, uh, a gap year, and things of that nature. See, they had to feed their families. <laughs> they didn't have all this life of luxury that many of us are blessed to have, but it was real back then. So he said, feed that curiosity young. The second decision he said was key was get started. So what that means is don't procrastinate, just get started young. We did a study in Chicago when I ran Chicago years and years and years ago. And we took the 10 most successful salespeople in the Chicago marketplace. And that was basically all of Wisconsin, Eastern Iowa, Chicago Central, and, and a ways down in the uh, kind of central uh, Illinois. We didn't go to Southern Illinois, the marketplace. And we asked lots of questions of these 10 high performers. We were looking for the silver bullet, the magic potion on recruiting and hiring all-stars and, and achievers. And there were a couple things that were very common. All of them were different, but there were two commonalities. They were raised by more or less blue collar level or leaning type parents. And they also all were entrepreneurial when they were young, had a paper route, washed cars, sold lemonade, had a job at, at, as soon as they were allowed to have one legally, picked up odd jobs, mowed yards, they got started. So it's just another attribute that uh, I agree wholeheartedly with, uh, with the Oracle on here that gets started in life. The third thing he touched on was the decision to find mentors. And I touch on this a lot on the show. Um, having someone give you feedback is a gift if you choose to accept it. I know I say that all the time. But having mentors around you and surrounding yourself with people that challenge you to move up versus stay low is a great attribute and a great approach to life. Surround yourself with the best people. Don't surround yourself with people that make you feel great because you're the, the tallest short person, the, the brightest uh, you know small wick candle. Don't do uh, this thing where you want to look the best of everybody. Don't be a prince among the paupers. Be a pauper amongst the princes. In other words, Surround yourself with people that are better than you because that'll drive you to be better. The fourth decision Warren talked about was be bold. And I am I am living this at work right now. We're on a roll. Uh, certain parts of my business right now that I'm fortunate enough to be a part of the team on. Uh, we got a couple of a, a leaders, um, uh, well, more than a couple. We've got a dozen leaders that are just killing it every single day. There's parts of our business that are a little bit lackluster, not as as, as uh, well performing as we'd like. That's always the case, right? If we'd ever hit on all cylinders, we'd all retire. But be bold is something I'm talking about now. I'm saying the ABCs, aggressive, bold, courageous. I actually use aggressive, brave, courageous as well. The B is, uh, can be switched around there. But be bold in life. Make a decision, do something, uh, well, I, I'm going to correct that in a minute, so I don't want to say it that way. Don't be scared of taking a little bit of risk in life because that's where uh, the bold go, right? Um, uh, the future favors the bold, as they say. The next decision, number five, was the decision to be healthy. This makes a lot of sense. Get out, walk, try to eat somewhat good, enjoy life. But a little bit of exercise. It doesn't have to be pumping iron three hours a day, but go for a walk every day. Try to get those eight to 10,000 steps in. Try not to smoke. If you drink, do it in moderation, something I couldn't do. It was all in or all, all out, right? I was um, five bourbons to get the thing started, 10 bourbons to enjoy the day uh, on a weekend or something. It's just, it's not good for you. And I'm really, really glad two years ago today uh, that I'm recording this, I quit drinking alcohol. So uh, an exciting time. I just realized that as I was speaking. It's actually also uh, one of my children's birthday. So uh, happy birthday 
uh, to the one that knows it's her day, just not giving too much information out on the, uh, on the airwaves here. But be healthy. Enjoy yourself. Laugh. Uh, get some vitamin D. Get outside. Don't be a ho-hummer. Be um, positive. Be uplifting. Be courageous. Be bold, right? And then the sixth one we discussed was the nurture relationships. Find good friends, find good couple friends, find people that mean things to you. Have a great relationship with your parents, have a great relationship with your siblings, have a great relationship with your neighbors, have a great relationship with your coworkers. Life's too short to be pissed off or to be angry or to be emotionally drawn down by those things that are around you. Be strong mentally and nurture those good relationships. So that was last week's. That's why uh, to sum up um, uh, last week's episode on the first six of the 12 decisions Warren Buffett said were really important to his life and his success. Now, the next six start off with an important one. It's number seven, and that is the decision to plan for afterwards. No one lives forever. You may be super healthy. You may be super happy. My mom turned 95 last week. She's feeling it. She's not going to live forever. Is your situation in order for after we are gone? What do I mean by that? Well, a couple things. I think of things such as, do you have a will? Have you established a trust? You don't need to be wealthy to have a trust. It's a simple documentation that allows you to avoid probate when you pass on. When someone passes on, it allows that money, those assets, those things to get to those you want to have. The will determines where it goes. The trust is how it gets there to avoid the government and the courts getting involved. If you don't have these things, get these things. If you want to be wealthy, do things that wealthy people did to help them become wealthy. Being accountable to your future and to those loved ones around you is a very big step on how you develop the mindset, the capacity, the capability, the, uh, the outlook to be financially independent, wealthy, rich, whatever you want to say. That distribution of wealth is a big one. And it doesn't have to be a lot of wealth, but do you want the house to go to uh, your loved ones uh, quickly and easily when you pass on? Do you want them to not have to come up with a bunch of cash right away because the federal government's going to tax you? and you have to start selling assets, all of these things can be avoided or minimized by the utilization of wills and trusts. Putting a plan in place to make this time as easy on your loved ones as possible is just a, a mature and right thing to do. Maybe you are a business owner and you need to work on secession planning. My wife, when she was in the insurance industry for years, helped owners with secession planning. Some people look at this and go, well, I don't want to talk about my own demise. That's just a bummer. Well, if you love those around you and you care about the business, you want to leave a legacy, you need to work on secession planning as an example there. Second to die, insurance policies, all these different mechanisms that you can utilize. See, what people don't understand <coughs> excuse me, is that they feel the, the, the wealthy or the successful got some magic potion somewhere. No, they didn't get a magic potion. They just learned what to utilize, what's available to help establish good habits and to um, enable the wealth to be passed on, etc. They weren't born any smarter. They just did things like, you know, read, <laughs> you know, get a financial magazine. I think every family should have a subscription of a magazine such as Money or Inc. or Fortune or Forbes. It's 25 bucks a year to empower you with lots of really smart people just giving you ideas and things to look into. It took me decades to establish some of the habits, and I don't have this all figured out. Please don't misinterpret what I'm saying that, hey, the doctor's got this one nailed. But I, I will tell you this, is when there's financial questions and investment questions and things like that at work, I am a person that people kind of turn to and ask for an opinion on. My family turns and asks my opinion on because they've seen what my wife and I have been able to build, and it comes from just educating ourselves. So you have to understand that um, planning for afterwards is just a necessity. So don't avoid that step. That's how you leave a legacy, not a memory. Number eight that Warren talked about, I like too, it's an important one. Know when to make the decision to cut your losses. I'm going to read that again. Know when to make the decision to cut your losses. 
All of us have faced a time where we didn't make the right decision, or if it was a right decision at first, we may not have recognized the need to disengage that decision when changes happen. Warren talks of his first big time facing this. See, Berkshire Hathaway uh, started before Warren uh, owned it in the textile business, clothing business, fabric business, right? And it took Warren a little longer than it should have for him to realize that in the, in the 90s, even some of the 80s, the textile business was no longer truly viable in America, in the United States. See, the Asian market's cost of labor was simply too much to overcome. Now, he, like us, love and have loyalties and emotions towards certain things. And some of us will stay in the wrong room of life for too long when it is uh, very evident we chose the wrong door. We chose the wrong room to go into. See, I faced this myself um, when I had the home building business. I had a custom home building business. I've talked about this before. It was a very sad point in my life. Um, it uh, was a time where a lot of things were going on. Uh, the market collapsed in 2008. I had a custom home building business. I had homes up. I had millions of dollars invested in this thing, and it had done well, and then suddenly it didn't. And I paid, and I paid, and I paid, and I paid to keep the thing afloat. And finally, I just had to figure, man, i got to cut my losses. i got to take the, the punch on the chin here, divest out of this thing, make it go away. And it cost me hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I probably should have pulled the, the chute far sooner on that. It was a valuable lesson in don't let your emotions hold you in a place that isn't healthy for you. I can remember being in court uh, during this, and I wasn't alone. My dad said a great thing. He goes, well, you outlasted Lehman Brothers. You outlasted Wachovia right? I stayed in it longer than them. They folded up and under when it all crashed. And I kept paying ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a month cash trying to keep this thing afloat with these homes up. And it was evident that I needed to do something else. And it, uh, like I said, it was a painful time, but pulling the chute sooner on that would have been better. But I went to court to finish some of this stuff up to work with a person to get the appropriate funds to everybody. And um, that year, in just the state of North Carolina, there were 150,000 people in the same situation, bankrupt and out of company, trying to turn something over to the banks, do whatever. 140, 150,000 people in just one state. It was rampant. But man, it hit my pride. But I needed to pull that chute sooner. I could have saved some more money probably. But it is what it is. I learned a lesson from it. So look at your life, cut your losses uh, when you uh, think you should right? Number nine, I love. I don't take myself too seriously. And he says the decision to laugh, that's my favorite. I really don't take myself all too seriously. Life is short and full of just crappy stuff that comes at us. If you don't learn to laugh at struggles and, and more importantly, at yourself, life is going to be a giant um, grind. It's just going to be a big, big problem. Go and look at Buffett's speeches and letters. See, every year he writes an investment letter. He gives speeches often. There are always jokes. Life is always more fun laughing. President Reagan used to do this all the time. He would always tell jokes in his speeches. How many times have you gone and watched a speaker and been there and, and uh, enjoyed when they were entertaining with laughter? Who's, you ask people favorite types of movies, it's romantic comedies or, or bro comedies. I mean, just, you know, guys, stupid stuff, something about Mary, that's kind of both, you know, um, Blazing Saddles, all of the, uh, the comedies for years that have been around. I loved going to comedies. It, it's the greatest stress reliever, cortisol burner in the world is to laugh. This country has become the herd of the can't take a joke. They can't. Lighten up. Laugh. Have a good time. Don't rain on other people's parades, especially. Don't be a Karen or a Kevin who constantly try to take the sheer joy out of life. You got to have a plan. Joy isn't a plan. Joy is not, and hope is not a strategy. But you can lower your stress levels. You can lower the anxieties of life. By enjoying it a little bit. It's the little things. 
It's the talking and laughing with neighbors. It's picking. Guys continuously pick on each other. That's how we do it. I pick on the ones I love. I make jokes of myself. I pick on the kids. I pick on my wife because it's all in good fun. My wife and I sit and watch. Uh, we're watching. Um, uh, oh gosh, I can't think of the name now. Uh, Shameless. Oh my gosh! If you haven't watched Shameless, first of all, buckle up. It's a little crude. It's got some nudity and things, and you, it, it's the greatest train wreck of a family ever. And my wife and I are in hysterics every night. We love that time together, just sitting there laughing, going, well, I guess our life isn't all that bad. So Warren says it. The doctor says it. Get out there. Enjoy some laughter. Enjoy some fun in your life. Don't let others take your joy and bring joy to others. That's number 10, really, bringing joy to others. Warren says his 10th great decision or key decision in his life was the decision to teach. See, I made this decision in my personal life, uh, or in my own life, I should say, not my personal life, my work life, in 1995. That's when I said, you know, it's not all about money, because if I had stayed an individual contributor, I'm sure, I'm confident I would have made far more personal treasure, but life is about other things. I made the decision in 1995 to go into management and eventually work into leadership. And see, those are two different words. Some people say, well, management and leadership are the same. No, no, they're not. I went into management because I thought, well, I want to lead a team because I saw a bunch of people on uh, around me that led and how not to do it. Then I decided and morphed as I got more responsibility to uh, lean into leadership. And that's showing the way instead of demanding the way. That's, that's not managing the business. That's driving the business, the individuals, et cetera. Everything everyone knows has been gifted to us and taught to us in a teaching moment in some manner. Open your eyes to feedback from others so you can be taught, but also share advice and lessons with others. That's what, I mean, really, this is kind of what started the Dr. Leadership Show. COVID locked everybody in the world up. There was no mentoring going on. There was no... Um, getting together in the offices. They were shut down. The hybrid work environment is far more work remotely than in the office. Some companies are doing two days in, three days out, so many days a month in. You're not on the same rotation with everybody. So we lost these connection points. So I started the podcast so I could help kind of teach some of these lessons, try to pay it forward a little bit, open people's eyes to feedback, share some advice and lessons that I've learned. Again, I didn't have this all figured out. I don't have this all figured out, but I do have some lessons to share. This is how we get the culture back in this country too. One of accountability, honesty, hard work, self-control, saving, loving, caring. We need really good teachers more than ever. Now, I will say this. We need teachers in the classroom. Um, Let's concentrate on reading, writing, arithmetic history, civics. Let's teach what the constitution means. Let's do those types of things. I mean, I, I was, I drove over to Chicago, uh, uh, for a meeting at the, the DNC a couple weeks ago and, um, a a bipartisan, um, meeting at the DNC and I'm listening to the news and there's schools in the Chicagoland area that zero students can read at eighth grade level. And this is 12th, 12th graders in high school. There's one high school over there only has 34 students. They have seven teachers, a principal, $10 million going into this school for 34 students. Not one of them can read and write. It's all about missing and, and going into the, 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 the darkness of uh, criminal activity because there's no hope, there's no leadership, there's no families, there's no fathers, there's no mothers together leading through these times. There's no teaching going on other than the guy on, hey, how much is a how much is a gram, how much is a half, how much is a quarter type crap, selling drugs on the corner, shooting people up, etc. We've got to grasp this back by empowering good teaching, being a good teacher, leaning into our communities. If we don't, that decision's going to haunt us. I hope it's recoverable at this point. The next one Buffett talked about, number 11, we're, we're coming in on the big close here. He nails this one. He offers a different perspective here. There's this old adage that says, 
Don't just stand there. Do something. I used to hear that when my dad would walk by, working for him when I was 12, 13, 14 years old. <laughs> what are you doing? Stand there. Find something to do. See, Buffett goes the other way. Don't just do something. Stand there. What he means is if you don't see any good options on something, then nothing is a good option. Do nothing. His precise quote here is actually this. The trick is when there is nothing to do, do nothing. Inaction, you see, actually, <laughs> it is an action. You have made a decision to do nothing. Think calmly, think clearly, and sometimes a holding pattern is the right answer. Think investing here for a minute. How many times have you been at a party and somebody says, oh man, I got in on this hot stock. You need to buy this. You need to buy this one, man. It's hot. It's hot, hot, hot. By the time it gets to me, the hot is gone. It's lukewarm. It's sitting under the heat lamp at the diner. My plate is not going to be hot. Because see, all the money's been made typically. The approach my wife and I have decided to take over the last 15 years together is slow wins the race. There's the rabbit approach and the hare approach. Or excuse me, there's the hare approach and the turtle approach. We've taken the turtle approach, and it's worked very well for us. See, people lose money when they react on the market. See, the market goes up and down, can be volatile at times, and it drives emotions. When it's hot, people are thinking, this is great, buy more, buy more. When in fact, you should be buying more when it's down. Our psyche actually plays tricks on us here. You need to hold when it goes down because it'll come back. Now, you need to know when to cut your losses back to number 9 or 10 that Warren talked about. If it's just not going to be good, if it has lost its luster for a long time, move the money into something else. But don't be trading out all the time. First time the market goes down a 1,000 points, panic, take it all out of the market. Because when it bounces back, you lose the opportunity to capture those gains back. It's called dollar cost averaging when you reinvest. Buy more when it's low. Now your average cost per share or piece of the company that you own is lower. And as the stock price goes up, you make more money. So don't um, always think you have to make a step. You can sit back and let time pass. Let more become, let, let the fog of war lift and clear out to see what you should do. But from an investing standpoint, invest often, use long-term thinking, don't bet against the U.S. market. For the last 100 years, 125 years, it has been consistent. Even with the Great Recession, depression of the late 20s and early 30s involved, it's made 10% a year on average any five years you look at. You can't go get 10% return. If, you'd get, if you would offer me 10% return forevermore right now on an investment, sign me up, Skippy. That makes life really, really easy. So, not making a decision is making a decision. And sometimes you have to understand to sit still and let the thing pass. Finally, the big finishing strong here, number 12. I could not agree more than with this one. We've talked about it. We've done episodes on it. Warren says the decision to give back. See, Buffett helped build out the giving pledge. If you don't know what it is, you should look it up. What it basically was, he and he got over 200 other billionaires to sign up, along with um, uh, Bill Gates uh, helped with this a little bit. They've separated since Gates destroyed his marriage and, and, and all the things happened. He's, he's a weird dude, is what uh, came to light. A lot of us knew it already. Uh, don't listen to his medical advice either, just something of my opinion. But basically, this giving pledge is committing to give the majority portions of these billionaires' wealth to causes upon their death. Now, maybe you're thinking, hey, hey, doctor, <laughs> I ain't no billionaire. I ain't even a millionaire. Some of you might not be thousandaires. Some of you may be measuring your net worth by how much gas is in your car. <laughs> I got eight gallons, man. I'm worth 30 bucks. But there's other things that you can use to give back. Remember, we have talked about this. There's three T's to giving. Treasure, that's what the billionaires are giving. They've all signed up to give the lion's share back to others. But there's two others that you can give, no matter how broke you are, how, how unflush in cash you might be. 
and that is your talent and your time. So the three T's are treasure, talent, and time. So you can give. It can be super rewarding. It can be the step for you to make a next step in life. Giving, seeing people are less fortunate, having a a new mindset, one of uh, compassion, one of caring, one of understanding, one of what you don't want to be that drives you, goes you back up to number two on Warren's list, get started, to put your head down, to work hard, to try even harder when you get knocked down to get back up. See, all of these 12 things that Warren talked about over the last two episodes do one very important thing. They lead you to awesome. Keep that shit up. Talk next week. <laughs>